Hey guys, and welcome to the Garage Athlete Show. It is just myself and Grant Paulson here today. We're on episode 63. So Grant is an ex-Marine and is co-owner of Recharge Fitness. So Recharge Fitness, uh, I believe, started just before the pandemic hit. They are a uh, seller and producer of uh, fitness equipment here in the UK. Um, I know Grant and Ryan. Uh, Ryan reached out to me, I think it was on Instagram actually a little bit, because he'd seen my work and he liked kind of like my ethos. We had a bit of a chat. Um, I've done a bit of work for Recharge in terms of writing some blogs for them. Um, and uh, I think you guys sent me some of those those lovely uh, pants when I was uh, in in uh, condition. Um, and yeah, I actually appeared on their podcast as well. So I thought we'd get Grant on today because there was a recent article going through kind of like his story and his journey into becoming a uh, kit manufacturer. And I thought it was really, really interesting and that the uh, listeners and the members of the group might like to hear from another one of the partners that we have in the trusted um section within the home gym community so with that i will kind of like hand you over to grant so um yeah why don't you introduce yourself buddy and give us a brief overview like how of how you kind of get got to where you are yeah no first of all thanks very much for, for having me on today Deech. appreciate that um yeah so as you said co-founder of recharge fitness um but this is sort of very much where i am on my journey um if I take you back um, 10 years, 11 years ago, um, I joined the Royal Marines um, as a young 20 year old lad, um, eager to be, I suppose, one of the UK's elite um, soldiers, really. Um, done that, I, you know, that, that did come with, with huge sort of challenges along the way. I mean, if those that are listening, you know, the Royal Marines have been. Um, quite a specialist force in the training, even to this day, is internationally recognised as being sort of the hardest or arduous training, infantry training in the world, bar sort of special forces. Um, that was eight months long. Um, so I passed out and I went down to 4-2 Commando down in, um, down in Plymouth. Um, 2011, I was then out in Afghanistan, which was pretty hellish, if I'm honest. Uh, really, really, really active tour. Um, a tour which took a lot of friends' lives and a, a lot of um, a lot of friends that you know injured from sort of blasts and, and gunshot wounds and stuff like that, which was which was pretty horrific. Um, I then left the Royal Marines after serving uh, five and a half years um, to move on to a career in the security industry. So I'd done my my security sort of licensing and stuff as I was coming out of the Marines. Um, jumped on board uh, vessels, big ships in the Indian Ocean. Uh, my job was to protect those from um, hijacking from Somalian pirates. Um, like if you've ever seen the film Captain Phillips, um, although that's yeah. a little far fetched, but I suppose it it, it does happen. Um, my time doing that role very boring, um, seeing very minimal action in terms of a threat from any sort of Somalian pirates. Um, however, which turned out to be my last ever job doing that, um, I got kidnapped in South Africa. I yeah, flew into Cape Town, um, got kidnapped by four guys at half 11 at night, um, roughed me into the back of a truck, sandbag over the head, um, smashed a pistol through my mouth. Um, yeah, had me for, uh, for four and a half, yeah, just over four and a half hours. Um, out the back of a truck, they kicked me out the back. I was now handcuffed. They bust all my ribs as well, and I had blood literally pouring down my face. I was in quite a bad way. Anyway, I went and done a four-week security job. Um, didn't tell my employer, didn't tell my, my partner or family back home. Just, just cracked on, done my thing. Got back to the UK. Um, obviously, sort of came clean to my partner, told her everything. She was like, look. Afghan was bad enough to deal with the aftermath of that. Um, it's time that you, not necessarily chasing the threat, but just do something that was, was a little less risky, you know, yeah. and family and everything. Um, <clears throat> now, I, I listened to her advice and I, and I stopped doing that job. 
Um, however, the money was really good doing that. Um, so I can imagine you know, when, when I was out in the sort of the high risk areas, they call it, you know, three, four hundred pound a day um, was money that I'd never earned before. So when leaving a job like that and it was all tax free as well, leaving a job like that um, kind of hit me quite hard because I was thinking, well, where am I going next? Uh, what am I doing next? Um, and I was always someone that was, even to this day, I suppose, quite driven by money. I, I, I sort of value, and maybe not the, the right way, but I see having money as being successful. Um, so that's when I took a, quite a big turning point in my life where it was, it was literally the worst six months and then subsequently three years that I'd ever been through. So I, I was then importing um, Viagra and on a small scale anabolic steroids, but mainly Viagra um, in from sort of India and, and Pakistan. Um, I got caught doing that. Um, I think someone up north, up sort of Manchester area, got, got, uh, got a bit jealous of the sort of money that was, that was to be made from doing that sort of thing. Um, grasped me up and yeah that came crashing down I got a 18 month um, sus suspended prison sentence um, a £10,000 fine and then I I got given bail um, also I got arrested five, five addresses got raided all at the same time all simultaneously it was like a 60 man operation police operation um, come crash crashing through my doors um, yeah and that was a big wake up call for me um, my partner, she was like, look, obviously what you were doing was, wasn't was right. Um, and I, I put it down to actually me not being in the best mental health state. Yeah. You know, I, I come from being a Royal Marine at, at Afghanistan. I went to do a security job, got kidnapped doing that, earning good money. The skills that I'd learned from being a Royal Marine just weren't all, they just weren't transferable out here. No. You, know, you give me a ride for, I'll hit someone from three, four hundred metres. That's great when you're a Royal Marine. But actually out here means absolutely nothing. Um, so I, I felt I found it hard to deal with that aspect of it. And, and that's sort of why I, I was led down that sort of, led myself down that sort of path. Um, it was when I set up my, my first business. So I used my Royal Marine experience to go into schools. Now, rightly or wrongly, um, obviously I'd been arrested then but I didn't have a conviction because I was going to magistrate's court, which was likely to go to Crown Court for the severity of it. So I came home one day from doing a little bit of labor and work. My partner, she had an A3 pad. She said, sit down. She said, I want you to write five things that you think you're good at. And I was like, okay, only five. Anyway, <laughs> she's like, write five things down. So I just wrote, you know, um, you know, raw marine experience, although it's not transferable, but there's a lot of good things in terms of what comes up the back of it, you know, being honest and um, always on time and hardworking and loyal and all that sort of thing. Um, good with kids. Um, well, that's quite a random one that I put in there. Anyway, about two days later, she came back to me. She says, well, why didn't you use those skills that you've got to go into schools and help children? In today's society, there's a lot of resilience lacking in well, children of all ages. Yeah. Um, that lack of determination, not wanting to try new things. Um, this, this one even sounds crazy still when I say it, but they'd much rather watch other children play computer games on their yeah. iPad than, than play it themselves. Yeah. That fear of failure. So between me and my partner, we, we came up with this business and um, we had kind of written a, a sort of syllabus where we were going into schools for a 12 week program, working with a, a group of children and the rewards that, or the feeling that I got from helping those children was just something I've never really experienced before. I've had, I've had the reward myself from standing in the parade square, giving my green beret, become a Royal Marine, but actually helping someone over a, a period of time and seeing them how they were day dot to 12 weeks later during my pro the program I sort of made, the change was phenomenal. 
And so I, I can knew. imagine with them being so young that yeah. it's very when you. So I've I've got a lot of experience in terms of kind of like mindset coaching and that like that's heavily within my coaching program. There's a heavy emphasis on that. Yeah. About overcoming obstacles, about problems are normal. Yes. Like actually part of being a human is just being a problem solver. That's what's made us the most successful species on the planet. But there's this phenomenon that I, I call it participation trophy syndrome, that everybody is taught from a very, very young age that just show up and you should get what you want when actually that's not how kind of like the world works. And because of that, people are afraid, as you said, fear of failure. They don't want to try new things because they might fail when actually to be successful, you've got to fail and you've got to fail fast. Yeah. Um, but I'm guessing with children, because they're at that more like impressionable age, yeah. somebody who comes in that's an ex-Marine and um, they might not have known kind of like your history, but to see somebody who's then successful and is saying like, like, failure is normal failure is good like we want you to fail and we want you to fail and fail again and fail yeah. until you get it right and that business was really hard because i had that the impending charge hanging over my mm. head now my dbs that i could have i got at the time that i'd always taken and showed the school was was completely clear and obviously i had a, a conscience that at some point i'm gonna have a a charge or even potentially go to prison you know mm -hmm. but what the, the sort of driving force behind it was that I knew that what I was actually doing was really positive. Yeah. So I, I've turned the most horrific negative um, into, into, into a big positive. And I, and I was helping, yeah. I was helping thousands of children every month. I had, I had 17 staff at one point. We were going all around the country, delivering like one day workshops, 12 week programs. And it was literally phenomenal. Um, but I could never, although I'm going and delivering these sessions, I, I always had to hold back a little bit because mm. I was always, I was so scared that there was going to come a time when it could potentially come crashing down. Yeah. So I brought people in that I thought at the time that I could trust, friends, which subsequently further down the line, because the business was doing so well and they felt that they were, um, taking Entitled. a lot more responsibility, yeah. they, they started to have me over a barrel. You know, they, they, wanted, they wanted equity, they wanted Gerald, they wanted huge salaries and, and stuff like that. And, and I was just like, no, this is my baby. I've, I've made a bad mistake. Yeah. However, it's, it's all about me. The program At the end of the day, you created it. And that's, that's something that people kind of don't understand when they kind of come in at a later date and there's already momentum. If they came in on day dot, and we're doing the levels of work that you were for free. Yeah. Like when you first created it, you probably wouldn't have been taking a salary from it. No. You'd have had to do that for what, six months to a year. And then when people come in and it's doing well, it's built momentum and money's then coming through, they, they want their piece. Like I've, I've experienced that as yeah. well. <laughs> I mean, I even had two guys who even served in the Royal Marines. That, mm. I mean, they're, they're older than me. I mean, one chap um, sort of in his fifties, late fifties. Um, he came in and was like, this is a great idea. I'm going to really help you scale this. And, and what I, what I and, and I suppose I was a little bit naive at the time, he, in the background, was actually building a business exactly like mine. Right. Um, and then He's copying it. And then when um, the, I went to Crown Court um, and it was all over the press, he caught wind of it. He, he, he went to certain schools with the article saying, this is the guy that you've had like come and come and do your work with me mm. and i was like you, how can you do that to somebody yeah you know um, so I've, I've learned some tough lessons you know i mean maybe yeah. that's a little yeah. bit karma from 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 my my wrongdoing previously so i take it on the chin um and and then moved on so that then took me up to the start of the pandemic really um mm. i had to put that business on hold quite quickly because we were, we were getting paid uh, on a retainer from school so they pay us like a monthly fee um when schools were catching wind of countries like france and italy back then when they were um you know closing everything down they knew that it wasn't long before the uk was shutting up shop so they stopped paying our invoices so i was i had gone from sort of getting i don't know seventy five hundred thousand pound in a month to literally nothing and I had a fit over 50 grand wage bill. So I was like, well, 
this, I can't continue to do this. And, and hopefully that this sort of pandemic and coronavirus just sort of goes away in a couple of months and we're all back to normal. Yeah. So I had to, you know, I, I took action. I sat my staff down. I said, look, you've probably seen the news, blah, blah, blah. We're going through sort of uncertain times. I don't know what's going to happen. No one does. If you are like really needing, well, we all need food on the table and roof above our head, but I can pay you till, I don't know, say, this was in March, I can pay you to the end of April. If you can get a job in the meantime, then, then great. And I'll relieve you of your position here. Anyway, they're all really good, the staff that I had. Um, and yeah, they all found a job probably within two weeks, whether that sort of stacking shelves in a local supermarket or whatever it was, just to just to make, you know, make sure that they, they had something. And yeah, and then literally a week or two after that, the furlough came in. Mm. So I thought, oh my God, I... I kind of didn't really need to, but that was me, you know, I'm very... You were being proactive about it. And I saw that happen quite a lot, actually, where businesses were being proactive and then the press jumped on them being like, oh, all these people are letting people go, like, yeah. the, and then it was, no, actually, they're, this is happening. The government haven't told us what they're going to do. There was that limbo time. It was about two weeks. Like, I was going through a very, very similar thing. Obviously, I was just on my own. But I went from having 20 to 25 face-to-face per -face personal training sessions a week yeah. to, right, the first sort of things coming in, oh, it'll be all right. And then that second week, I started to get people sort of dropping out of their sessions. Yeah. And then, right, lockdowns are coming in, gyms are closing, you can't see anybody like face-to-face -face indoors. So within the space of two weeks, I went from, as I said, 20 to 25 sessions a week to zero. Like it, it was scary, especially if you're self-employed or you're a business owner and it's just like, right, well, what? And as I said, the information coming out, right, they came out with the furlough scheme. Great. That covers people who are employed. What about self-employed people? It took them about four weeks after oh, yeah. to get something together. And then for me, I'd only made my business in the August before so I didn't have a first year's tax return, so I could claim I could claim nothing. Um, so in here, I, I was just paid. I was I was just paid by dividends, so yeah. I was you know, I was even employed on our payroll. So I you know I, I couldn't take anything. So that that sort of put an end to that. And then Ryan, as you mentioned, so Ryan, I went to primary school, secondary school with Ryan up here in Cheltenham. Um, always he he then moved down to Bristol after. Um, well, no, we had to form with university, then up to Bristol um, to do his sort of university. And I obviously joined the Marines and then came back to Cheltenham once I left that. He reached out to me on LinkedIn. Um, it was like he did every now and again, we just sort of check in with each other. He's like, look, what you, how are you going to sort of get through this uncertainty with, um, with your business? And I was like, I've let everyone go. They've all found new jobs. Um, I'm sort of fending for myself. I'm going to try and do bits and bobs, a bit of labour. And if builders are able to still work, then I'll just turn my hand to anything, really, anything to, to you know, most, well, I say most men, most men probably won't, but I mean, I, I'm that way inclined. I'll just do anything mm. to get food on the table, roof above my head, so up to my family. So um, he said, look, if you've got any ideas, so I've got a bit of time myself, obviously, um, you know, we could do something together or work on something together. And I was like, well, yeah, I think, Gym equipment is massively in demand. And this is obviously April, April, March, April time. He's like, oh, let me um, go away and do a little bit of um, sort of research. So he, he, he said, crikey, so I can get hold of gym equipment. He said, it's like three, four, five times the price. That's crazy. Um, and also, because Ryan's got a, a home gym as well, um, back when he set that up, I think that he really sort of found it hard to, you know, you've, you've got the likes of, your row, your row, and your elite that do everything that's sort of top end and mega expensive. But and then you've, you've got businesses at the other end of the scale, sort of cheap and cheerfully, not really sort of trusted in terms of quality. There was not really anyone in the in the sort that of middle ground. Yeah. So, at the start of the pandemic, there was nobody in that middle ground. Yeah. Like so, the yeah. only people that were trying to be there was probably Mirafit. Yeah. And they had pretty much had a monopoly. Yeah. So he was like, he said, No, I remember back actually from me trying to get my gym, I struggled to, to find you know, a reputable sort of supplier that wasn't going to charge a year. Um, anyway, so we got a container, <coughs> excuse me, of equipment over. And then it was just, well, we had luck on our side. 
we, we set up a company. And if I'm honest, it was always a probably a temporary temporary thing. Didn't ever really expect us to get to where we are today. It was like, how can we turn 25 grand into 50 grand just to keep yeah. money coming in for ourselves? First container arrived. Um, it was already pre-sold within probably 48 hours. Um, opened the doors. The kit was fantastic. It was like commercial grade kit, which obviously is good enough to go into a home gym. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. And we just got the price right. We, we, we kept it affordable. There was yeah. no, you know, we looked at the sort of pricing like two, three, four, five years ago as to what companies were charging. And, and we just went in with a similar price point. We didn't, we didn't inflate it to what other companies were doing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there, there, was, there was profit to be made doing that. Yeah. So, I mean, in our, in our view, was well, how can these businesses be sort of really kind of ripping the arse out the pricing and, and charging people far more money? When we're, we're in a pandemic, we're, yeah. we need to actually be helping people. And that's going to turn around and bite those companies now because they're now having to massively discount to bring their pricing back to being competitive now that the arse has fallen out of demand. Yeah. But people are going to be going, well, if you could sell at this price and still make, a money, make money, recharge, like the, the companies that are around that price point now, they're like, yeah. well, these guys are selling there now and yeah. they're, they're still happy to make that same sort of thing. They don't yeah. need to put on massive discounts because they, they never, as you said, inflated their price. It's, yeah. People argue kind of like the whole supply versus demand thing and all that, and I, I understand that. However customers there's no customer loyalty nowadays however if you recognize a brand as looking after its customers you are going to foster some sort of loyalty especially with gym equipment because it's not like you you pay every month it's you buy a product and then so say if it's a rack you buy a rack the only time that you're going to then spend more money is if you're upgrading your rack you're not going to then buy a new rack every two or three years because it's just a slab of metal yeah exactly so i mean yeah going back to sort of um what you're saying regarding sort of discounting so we obviously we've done our black friday um well last friday and it finished on sunday mm. and we, we gave 15 percent off across our whole website mm. now when we had our team meeting we were like some you know a couple of the sort of junior staff here they were like there's businesses out there that are doing like 30 40 50 percent and i was like well they might well be doing that. I said, but if you look at their their starting price, for example, before the discount came in, I says they, they probably boosted their hex dumbbells up to three pound fifty a kilo, so they can they could they could do a forty percent sale. I said, when when you're sat at like two sixty two seventy a kilo, and we're taking fifteen percent off, you know. Um, so one side of us is being very open and transparent, but then you've got to think actually to the con- to the consumers. They go well. We charge only doing a 15% off. They maybe don't see that actually our pricing back in the pandemic was far cheaper than anyone else. Mm. Um, and even to this day, it's probably still cheaper than a lot. Um, and, and the quality is there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, 18 months of, of being in this business, it's been, it's been good fun, but it's come with its challenges. Yeah, of course. I mean, the biggest challenge that we deal with as a business is couriers. Yeah, I, I can't believe when we have we have weekly meetings on on uh, people's orders that have maybe um, been damaged in transit, been lost, or gone to the wrong depot, and and it, it happens. I would I would probably say it happens at least thirty to fifty times a week. Wow, where it leaves our warehouse, we've done our job. We've got that nice and quick, packaged it really well. Communications great with the customer, let them know it's on the way, and then you're expecting a third party company to, to essentially just do the job that they're paid to do. And when they fail to do that, it, it hits us quite hard and it's very, very frustrating. So yeah, we have to deal with that on a weekly, well, daily basis actually. So mm-hmm. yeah, so that's where I am today. No worries. So yeah, very, very um, interesting kind of like story in a nutshell. I think it's one of those, as you said, it's, you seem like the type of person that, when they hit adversity, they don't just sit there and take it. They're going, right, this is a challenge. How am I going to turn this negativity into a positive outcome? And obviously it's not been easy, 
but it's also not been standing there and kind of like feeling sorry for yourself as well. So I, I very much admire that mindset, one hundred percent. Um. So in terms of like, where do you think that mindset came from? Do you think you've always had that or um, that was instilled into you in the Marines or kind of like where, where, when did yeah, that's that? A good question. That's a good question, actually, because I get asked it quite a lot, but I, I also think about it a lot myself. Mm. Um, and I think there's a few key points in my life, which is sort of amplified the mindset yeah. where, for example, um, as a kid, I was, I was a good footballer. So, you know, from the age of like 12, 13, 14, I, I was at Aston Villa. Um, but actually, I stopped playing for Aston Villa because I realised that I wanted to be a professional footballer and play at the highest level, so in the premiership. And I wasn't, I wasn't good enough. And, you know, as you get older, you start to, you know, you go into the academy and... There's a lot more um, kind of pressure and expectations for you to train more regularly and stuff like that. Um, you know, they sit you down and they, they give you an honest opinion without sort of hampering your confidence too much. And <clears throat> I just wasn't good enough to ever be, um, not necessarily a professional, but to, to continue playing for Aston Villa, continue through that development. Now, rightly or wrongly back then, I was like, well, that's it. I'm I either want to play at the highest level and I, and I didn't really give myself a chance to maybe um, <clears throat> potentially get scouted for anyone else. Um, <clears throat> so I took up boxing, which I was a keen boxer anyway. I was like watching it and stuff like that. So, and when I was playing for Aston Villa, I couldn't do both. Hmm. So um, loved boxing, didn't really have any aspirations of, of necessarily wanting to get in the ring. Um, but actually I love the type of training that it, that it involved, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes, short, sharp, um, sort of hit workouts, fragging myself basically for that period of time, coming out absolutely exhausted, but feeling amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so going through obviously secondary school, left, um, worked in my family, dad's family run business. Uh, I was a salesman and I was always ambitious, wanted to hit the sales targets and be the best salesman that he had and I'd only been there six months and this guy's had been there 25 years, you know? Um, but I, yeah, I just had this burning desire to always to want to be the best. I'm a very much, uh, I'm all in 100% or I'm 100% out. But if I'm 100% in, I give it absolutely everything. Okay. You know? um, so, yeah, I, I didn't really know what to do. I got to sort of 19, 18, 19. I didn't really know. Was it a big crossroads in my life? Which I think, if anyone's re, uh, you know, watching this and you're that sort of age, 17, 18, 19, and you're at the point where you don't really know what to do, you're, you're not alone in thinking that. You know, it's pretty normal. Lot, pretty normal. Lots and lots of people feel that. And do you know what? It was only, I think it was a friend or something who said, look, why don't you go and join the military? He says, you're, you know, you're fit and you sort of, you know, you got this sort of hemped up sort of aggression and, not, not in a nasty way, but just yeah. that kind of, ugh. That drive to be the best sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, so I went to a careers office, um, sat down. It was actually an ex-Royal uh, Marine who was there, an older chap. He said, tell me a bit about you, what you like doing. But he says, you want to join the Royal Marine? You do. And I was like, really? I said, I, and I hadn't had military in the family or anything like that. Yeah. He said, oh, um, so I'm going to leave you in here for 20 minutes. Watch this video. So I watched this video, and I was like, that's a bit of me, that is. <laughs> I, I want to do that. So... Literally, we have done some paperwork. A few weeks later, it was a couple of tests. And then, yeah, probably about six months later, I, I wanted to join the Royal Marines. And I wanted to join the Royal Marines because I wanted to be an elite soldier. I mean, no... So that was, that was going to be my next question. Because obviously, yeah. Royal Marines training, I've seen some stats on it. It's something like only like 5 or 10% of people who are apply actually kind of like make it out so my next question was going to be like is it as hard as obviously the um the training office is kind of like make it look and uh, you managed to pass that the, the first time or did you have to go through it multiple times yeah yeah no i passed it so we started with 55 mm -hmm. lads in our troop from on week one day one 
And then by the end of week 32, there was actually only seven of us left from the original number. Wow. Okay. Uh, so yeah, wrong. about 90% then. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but on, um, <clears throat> but every two weeks, there's a new troop that start training in the ring. So what ends right. up happening is you get to, a, you know, week, I don't know, 18 or 20, and then you can get guys who have been injured, for example, in rehab. Mm -hmm. uh, when they went into rehab or in week 20 of their training, when your troop gets to week 20, they can then fall into your troop and continue right. their training. So when it got to, um, on, the, on the parade square, when we got given our green beret, there was, there was seven originals, but then there was probably another 10, 15 of guys who had joined us at a later date. Yeah. And the, so it and wasn't just the, seven of you like doing, yeah. <laughs> doing yeah. stuff. Being but to answer your question, the training was, yeah, I'm not going to sit here and, and say it's easy by any means. Just because I was uh, an original, it was, it was bloody tough. I mean, yeah. the physical side, which is what you can prepare yourself for. I mean, you can, you can run, you know, get your mile and a half down to sort of, I don't know, eight minutes or whatever. Um, you can bang out as many press ups, you can do as many pull ups as you want, but it's that the mental side. You know, is it similar to like what they say in like the seals where they, they want to break you down oh, mentally yeah. so that they can then rebuild you as the best soldier? Like they, they only want people in there that can deal. Well, at the end of the day, you're going into a very, very, as you said, hostile territory. You're going to be dealing with basically life or death situations for days, if not weeks at a time. If somebody's not got a strong mind and they're not going to follow orders in that, that's when you then get the rest of the people that are there killed. Yeah, you know, and just to give you a, a small sort of snippet. So one lad in our tray in our troop, he'd done something wrong. I can't remember what it was. And we, we all got a thrashing and you take it on the chin. It's like the one and all, you know, so one person lets himself and the troop down, you all get punished. Yeah. Which yeah. You, after the third, well, the second, third, fourth time that happens, you just, you just kind of deal with it. Now, it yeah. This particular time, I can't remember what he'd done, but it was quite severe. Um, it must've been something to do with his, his weapon. Anyway, he had to take uh, his whole contents of his locker, well, two lockers, um, which is obviously folded pristinely and set mm -hmm. out pristinely. And, you know, his bed, which was a metal bed, right? He had to take that probably half a mile onto the parade square for seven o'clock every morning and seven o'clock every night. And it had to be perfectly done. And when he had inspected, he would have to then take it all the way back. So he had to do that for a week solid. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. The rest of the lads and myself in the troop, you rally around that person and, and you help them out and you build that camaraderie. Um, but yeah, that, that would break 99% of people, you know. Yeah. And, and don't get me wrong. So I started training. Um, it was March. So this was kind of three quarters away. So you get into like... October time and it's like it's cold. two, three degrees yeah. and he's yeah. doing this, you know, and, and he, you know, he did, but he ended up passing out and he's actually a good friend of mine. Um, but they're sort of small snippets of like the ways and they try and break you. And another, just another quick one is we were the top floor accommodation, which was mm. all floor up. And um, again, someone done something wrong. 40 lads in the troop at that point, we had to empty the whole contents of our locker over the banister onto the floor beneath and then we all had to get bear in mind we had like three shirts three pairs of trousers our blues which is our smart uniform everything sports gear um we had to think of two liters of um, two liter bottles of water each stand on the balcony and tip it all over our clothes below and this would say 11 o'clock at night and then by six o'clock in the morning we had to have our, our whole lockers pristine for inspection and then you've got, you've got like, I don't know, a couple of thousand pieces of clothing on the floor, which you hope everyone's named. You've, you know what I mean? So it's just a yeah. mind. Yeah, you yeah. know. Wow. Yeah, it was tough. It was tough. Yeah. So um, I don't know how much you're allowed to kind of like talk about like your tour in Afghanistan. But what I wanted to ask was like, obviously you said you lost uh, a lot of good men there um it was how how firstly like how many tours did you do um kind of like what sort of if you're allowed again if you're allowed to say like what sort of areas like were you in and then my final question was going to be like 
how do you feel about kind of like what's happened recently with basically the piss poor dealing with the handover of power so that the Taliban's just come back in and, and taken over? Does, like, how do you feel kind of about that? Yeah, well, I suppose first and foremost, what I'd like to say is um, there is service uh, military personnel that have gone out to Afghanistan that would have, you know, would have not necessarily seen it worse than me, but off the back of it, would have come out of it, whether that's injured or extreme PTSD. So there's, there's a lot worse people that have, you know, gone, gone through the, the ring and more than me. So just wanted to say that first of all. But for me, my I already done the one tour, but, but one was enough. Um, being in a daily battle, I mean, we, we were operating out of checkpoints, which you are right in amongst the locals, you are um, potentially in amongst the Taliban because you, you obviously don't know who so they are. You're not going to be able to tell. You don't yeah. know who they are. Um, and, you know, there's, there's ways in which they are, they operate, which you can't do anything about. For example, you can't even look or search for, you know, a woman, for example. So, you know, they could be smuggling anything into a, in a woman, going through in cars and all that sort of thing. And, and when you get to understand that, you, you, you think we're actually fighting something that we're never ever going to win because mm -hmm. there's there's tactics that they can use that we, we just can't we can't we can't counteract it you know yeah. um so and they knew that the taliban there's they're very it's as much as they're thousands of thousands of years behind us in terms of things like technology you know but they're switched off you know they're, they know they're smart to, well they, they know ran how, a they guerrilla know warfare. They know how to use that effectively. Cram it full of explosives made yeah. out of crap and hurt people. Well, it's just that they essentially the Americans trained them to fight the Russians in what the eighties, and then wondered why they were then so good at guerrilla warfare when they came in and they were trying to get them out. You know, so you know. Patrol daily, you know, getting attacked daily, grenades coming over the wall. You know, you, you're all sleeping with one eye open. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it was it was horrendous. It was really horrendous. Um, and the, the main reason actually why I left the Royal Marines wasn't necessarily actually with what I encountered and what I saw, uh, because because at that time actually it never really had hit home until probably a year or two after I left the Royal Marines. But I left because when you do a stint out in Afghanistan for like six, seven months, you get given a lot of, also a lot of leave when you get back. You yeah. sort of bank it all. Anyway, so we we got back to sort of Camp Bastion and, and they, we got told, you know, you can have seven or eight weeks off when you get back. Uh, bear in mind, this is end of November. Um, you know, you're not going to be required back into work until like well after Christmas sort of thing. So, we were making phone calls to our loved ones and, you know, the partner that I had back then, I was like, look, book a holiday, got money in the bank, take us wherever, all inclusive, two weeks, just, you know. And I got back to the UK uh, within a couple of days, um, phone call, yeah, you required back to camp. Um, we're going up to Scotland to Ben Nevis to do some mountain training in December. And we were like, what? You know, we've got trips and, you know, all this sort of booked. And it's like, yeah, lads, sorry you're only going to have like two and a half weeks off as opposed to eight and right. you know what that was a point when I said nah, they, I knew I was a number anyway in the military but I always thought that we'd be better looked after especially the job that we just done for the last seven months you know yeah and um, we needed that time to um sort of replan and, and sort of spend time with our families and just not being in that sort of military environment and then, yeah, so we went from, I mean, a summer tour in Afghanistan as well, like 50 degree heat, mm. 45, 50 degree, is that, I mean, your, your body armour on, your clothing, your, I mean, I lost over two and a half stone out there. Um, so then going to Ben Nevis in December. In December, minus, wow. Minus 10, probably. Jesus. That's like, a, that's like a 50, 60 degree difference in temperature. That's yeah. Like, that's like that's crazy. That's going to be a major shock, <laughs> especially if you've just okay. lost two and a half stone as well. It's not so like you've got any body fat. I said, I'm done. So I, I went on the system and, um, you know, probably about six months after I come back from Afghan, I was like, bang, I'm done. This is me. Um, I want to go and, 
you know, I, I felt that because I'd been out to Afghan and I felt like I had accomplished kind of what I set out to do. Yeah. That makes sense. Because um, if you join the Royal Marines today, you know, you, you're probably not going out to war unless obviously something happens. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, know, you don't join to go to war. And I didn't join necessarily to go to war to, to sort of um, be involved in that sort of, but, I, but it, was, it was that wanted to be the best and be part of something and be yeah. remembered to be part of something, you know? Um, yeah, so it was, yeah, that, that was the reason why I left and then I obviously went into, onto the security then from there. Yeah, so onto a less uh, serious subject. So would you say in terms of like recharge, obviously with the gyms and everything opening up, what was that in July? I think it was. I'm guessing you'll have noticed there's been a bit of a slowdown in demand for gym equipment as essentially the market was flooded. There was lots of companies that started up in the pandemic. Yeah, I'm starting to notice quite a few of those little ones are starting to kind of like disappear now. And there's guys like yourself that have again pivoted and have gone into more of like, a, um, well, they've picked a niche that they're working with. And for yeah. you guys, it seems to be like rugby clubs, football clubs, like grassroots level sport, which are desperate for basically equipment that they can use at, well, they, they've got clubs, but yeah. the club's only used on a weekend. So would you say that's kind of like an area that you guys are looking to invest in more? Are you wanting to work more with grassroots sports? Um, definitely. I mean, we, you know, we've got a 8,000 square foot warehouse here, which is absolutely crammed to the hill full of kit. Okay. Mm. If we can, and we're obviously based in Gloucestershire, if we can help sports clubs or, or even, even, children getting into sort of lifting it if it's all done in the proper way you know if we can help these clubs and, and, and children or, or schools for example have some kit which is affordable but doesn't even have to be paid now it can be spread over a payment term and hmm. and it's just getting ourselves out there and and showing that we are willing to help yeah uh, and i think you know if you were to which i'm sure you're obviously aware of our, our instagram page if you were to look on there you know, we're not a hard sell of a, of a company. You know, we'll drip feed our products out there because, yeah, that's what we do. We're a gym equipment company. We don't want to be forgotten about that. But it's, you know, given that Monday motivation, it's given, like, every Wednesday we give a physique of the week. So that's, that gives someone a platform for us to say, look at this amazing person, what they've achieved. You can do it mm -hmm. yourself. Um, we do, uh, on Thursday, for example, it's something new. It's celebrating amazing women in sport. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly things like women's rugby who we have great connections with it's actually given females uh, a voice yeah i'm a sportsman you're a sport you're an athlete you know when us men you know we i suppose we've had it easy we have it easy but to an extent but and i think for women there's some phenomenal phenomenal athletes out there just as capable as men mm. Let, let's hear about them let's showcase yeah. them you know, and that's that's kind of really our angle, in honesty. Um, but going back to your point about sort of companies that you've seen sort of pop up during the pandemic and they're, they're sort of slowly fading away. And, and there's a couple of reasons why that is, and I'm sure you already know, but with shipping costs being absolutely... You know, with manufacturing costs, actually, over in, over in likes of China are, are through the roof as well. Um, you know, companies, if they haven't got that niche or haven't got that infrastructure to, to be able to continue trading with those heavily inflated prices, then they're, they're going to suffer. So um, we've, we've done well. We've got, you know, lucky. You need, you, need a, you need a degree of luck. Yeah. You know, we've got some great connections high up in some places where, you know, we can go into football clubs. We can do some Liverpool footballers. We can go do... Bristol Bears, Gloucester Bear, Bears, rugby players, you know, we could do celebrities and, you know, it's, but it's providing good a quality, good quality equipment at affordable pricing with exceptional service. What, what can go wrong? You know? I think that's what sets you guys apart. There's a few companies that 
have come out kind of of the back end of the pandemic that we're starting to see are actually thriving still yeah. because of those key factors that you've put in there. They have good quality. Um, there are affordable prices. They might be targeting different areas of the market, but yeah. the area of the market that they're targeting can afford their prices. And then they have good quality customer service. So it's like something that obviously um, I'm an admin of the Home Gym UK community group on Facebook. So plug there for anybody who's not kind of like a member. If you are looking to get involved in like home gym stuff, like it, that's a great forum. There's what, 10,000 plus people on there. Lots and lots of questions. Basically, the group pretty much runs itself nowadays. And we are looking at, we make sure that anybody who gets onto the like approved companies list, we have tried their products, we've tried their customer service, and therefore we want to make sure people are getting quality kit just because, there, as you said, there's a, there, was a, there was a big gap in the market for that middle ground where people don't want cheap and cheerful and it's going to break in a year but they don't want to be paying rogue Elico. Like they're, they're not high level power lifters. They don't need a bar that you can deadlift 500 kilos on or whatever it is. Like they need stuff that's going to last a while, but it's not going to kind of cost the earth. And there's been a few kind of that have kind of like popped up. So the, the big and kind of like final question for yourself is like, what what are the plans kind of like moving forward have you got any exciting kind of things that you kind of like want to announce or like where do you see recharge in like a year three five years time yeah well with my you know going back to sort of how i always want to be the best ryan co-founder he's very much on the same page everything that we that we do we put a lot of time and effort and energy into it to, to want to be the best now like you just mentioned, there's some great gym equipment companies out there. I am here. Keep talking. There's somebody at the door. <laughs> I'll, I'll carry yeah. on for those yeah. that I want. Um, yeah, so there's some great gym equipment companies out there that are doing some great things. Um, for us, we're going to continue offering the, the great quality gym equipment at the, at the prices that are affordable and the service being exceptional. Um, we are moving into a few exciting things. So we are working with... Um, uh, sort of top end sort of cabins for those that are kind of people that are working at home um, sort of kind of plush cabins that have got a, an office and a, and a gym in there as well um, we are looking to attend more events and festivals um, so we were going to do the Arnold this year but we, we decided against it um, just because we, we were so busy doing other things but yeah attend, attend more events similar to that um, and actually then probably break out into Europe. So a lot of our sales on a daily basis, whether that's the home market or the commercial gyms that we work with is very much here in the UK. Um, but now we've got the infrastructure in place, we can now start opening the doors into Europe. Okay, um, that'd be it, interesting. It does, it does come with a, a few more uh, sort of challenges along sort of paperwork and obviously leaving Brexit. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say so, Brexit probably uh, made that a little bit more challenging. But but yeah, we we just want to continue doing the good things that we do, um, okay. even refine them and make it even better if we can. Um, yeah. New product lines coming in, so we now do like uh, rigs. So we we're doing a lot of work with CrossFit gyms. So rigs we can actually do customizable rigs. Um, our dumbbell racks can be customizable. You know, so if someone's got two point five up to seventy, for example. We can put, you know, we can manufacture a, a rack to, to to suit that. Um, yeah, it, and it's it's just. It's your quick question: Is your manufacturing UK based, or are you yes. still importing? Your manufacturing is UK based. Okay, that's quite a unique thing, actually. Not for, um, everything. Not for everything. No, no, I can uh, imagine. You know, but for some key products that you really rely on the quality being exceptional, and they're mm. going into CrossFit gyms that are going to be battered every day. Yeah. Uh, don't get me wrong. You do get some get good quality kit from overseas, but so that we can have more control on the quality, ease of communication, faster yeah. turnaround, uh, reducing our carbon footprint, things like that. Uh, yeah, working with a, a, a UK manufacturer very closely as well. So, um, yeah, we've got our a clothing line which we are just refining at the minute, which will be launching just before Christmas, which. 
it's, it's going to have some really sort of nice looking products that you probably wouldn't expect a gym equipment company to you know you might you might normally see it traditionally at something like Gymshark because they're renowned for their clothing it's it's going down the route of quality sustainability with the materials that we would use okay uh, and things like that so yeah there's, there's a lot to come from us awesome well that's that's great to hear that you're as always, not just sitting back and waiting for the good times to kind of come back around. You're innovating, you're problem solving, and you are making the most out of the opportunities that are there rather than waiting for them to come to you, which is, as I said, it's, it's amazing to see. I have a lot of respect for both uh, for yourself and for Ryan, obviously getting to know you a little bit better today and um, definitely feel that recharge is going to be one of those companies to watch over the next few years obviously you're in your first couple of years and you've uh, been is it nominated or won the best retailer of the year twice yeah, now is it yeah we won that twice yeah yeah so you're obviously doing something good <laughs> or else you you wouldn't have kind of won those awards etc so um we'll probably wrap it up there people are probably a little bit bored of, um, of me asking you questions by now um so uh, if people want to find yourself or find recharge like where where can they find you on let's go like instagram website and facebook yeah so website is www.recharge.fitness.co.uk uh instagram is at recharge underscore fit and facebook is just recharge for at recharge fitness that'll come up perfect so uh for anybody who's listening i will pop the links um in the description below well as, as a lot uh, along with all the other links to um like all the other code there's a there's a whole list of links but your ones appear at the top so you'll have the show notes and then the links are just underneath the show notes if you guys are struggling to find them so yeah been great to have you on grant it was great to catch up and i'm sure uh, the guys have found this useful and yeah i'll love to have you back on again soon thank you very much for having me mate take care no worries, dude all the best